Welcome everyone to the second event in the Yale Lectures in Medieval Studies Spring 2021 series. We're very glad that you're able to join us today over Zoom. Today's lecture will also be recorded for the sake of those who are not able to attend. My name is Larissa Tsukamoto and I'll be introducing today's guest speaker. But before I do, I would like to thank our generous sponsors without whose support we would not be able to invite such distinguished speak from speakers from across the country and around the world. Our sponsors include the Archaea Program, the Macmillan Center, the Institute of Sacred Music, the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the Divinity School, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Dean's Fund. I would also like to thank my fellow committee members for their help with organizing this event and those to come. They are Theo Breen, Shahruz Khalifian, Carson Kepke, and Rachel Wilson. Finally, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Yale University stands upon the traditional territories of the Quinnipiac people who were dispossessed of their ancestral homelands. Now, I am honored to introduce our speaker, Professor Nayir Otanio Garcia, who serves as Assistant Professor of English and Medieval Studies at the University of New Mexico. Among her many theoretical frameworks include the Global North Atlantic, including Britain, Iberia, and Scandinavia, translation theory and practice, and critical identity studies. Professor Otanio Gracia is also an activist medievalist working to create a more inclusive medieval studies. The article Constructing Prejudice in the Middle Ages and the Repercussions of Racism Today, co-written with Daniel Armenti, appeared in Medieval Feminist Forum's special issue on microaggressions, harassment, and abuse, medieval and modern, and her essays Lost in Our Field and Welcome to a New Reality, Reflections on the Medieval Academy of America's panel, discuss the ways that medieval studies has begun to diversify the field and the ways it has fallen short. Professor Otanya Gracia has helped create the Medieval Academy of America's Belle da Costa Green Award to be given annually to a medievalist of color for their research. She's currently working on her monograph, The Other Faces of Arthur, Medieval Arthurian Texts from the Global North Atlantic, and her co-edited volume, Women's Lives, Self-Representation, Reception, and Appropriation in the Middle Ages. It will be coming out with the, new, with the University of Wales Press in early 2022. She's currently a member at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University, thanks to a Mellon Fellowship. Today, Professor Otanio Gracia will be giving a talk titled Broken Dreams, Medievalism and Race in Alejandro Tapia y Rivera's Postumo el Envirginiado. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Otanio Gracia. I now yield the floor to you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, first, I would like to thank Larissa and the Yale Lecture in Medieval Studies for inviting me to give a talk and to the audience for being willing to spend their evening with me on a Zoom, so thank you. Um, I, I do want to let everybody know that I will be talking about slavery and the violence of slavery, so I wanna uh, give you a warning. And um, I would like to start my talk by saying that I am from Puerto Rico whose original people, the Tainos, experienced cultural genocide and other atrocities. I am giving a talk for Yale University, which is situated in the traditional ancestral homelands of the Quinnipiac people. And I, I live in Princeton, New Jersey, which is the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenape people. And I am affiliated with the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, land of the Pueblo people. We work and stand on stolen land. I would also like to say, that I stand in solidarity, love and care with the Asian and Asian American community. And I grieve with them the recent Atlanta shooting and the continued violent assaults that white supremacy has enacted and continues to enact on our communities. My talk is titled Broken Dreams, Medievalism and Race in Alejandro Tapia Rivera's Postumo en Virginiado. But I will also be talking about the play La Cuarterona, because you cannot understand Postumo without understanding La Cuarterona. Medieval revivals have infiltrated Puerto Rico by several distinct venues. First, they migrated from Spain and the rest of Europe and Latin America to Puerto Rico. Later, they would come through 19th and 20th century medievalisms from Spain, Latin America, and the United States. Finally, through films, role-playing games, video games, and comics, mainly from the US popular culture. In tandem with these medieval incursions, were the colonizing efforts of Spain and the United States. Well, it's not surprising that medievalism would arrive with colonization. What was unforeseen and now understudied 
is that medievalism has been steadily reconceptualized by Puerto Rican writers as a unique cultural and political tool to present their ideo ideological ideas. And let me take a second here and open up my screen. Puerto Rican writers have appropriated medieval myths such as the King Arthur Lurton. Similar to 19th and early 20th century medievalisms, which used the Middle Ages to sort of solidify or reject hierarchical notions based on race, Puerto Rican writers use medieval themes to create their own ideologies on Caribbean race-based formation. I really... And I really recommend um, Matthew Vernon's book, The Black Middle Ages, to see how, uh, how um, different, how the, in the United States, race is very much entrenched the idea of the Middle Ages. Puerto Rican writers were aware of the trends of movements taking place in both Europe and the Americas and used them to create and enhance the Puerto Rican literary canon, as well as to create an elite serving Puerto Rican identity. Although the use of medieval things might seem counterproductive to these aims, writers such as Eduardo Gonzalez Pedroso, Alejandro Tapia Rivera, and Luis Vales Matos use medievalism to further their own colonial and anti colonial political agendas. These three authors use rhetorical devices commonly used in the foundational fictions of Latin America to further expand and solidify Puerto Ricanness, and they turn to racial categories, including mulataje, mestizaje of whiteness and of marked whiteness to do so. Rebecca Anrod in Fictions of Whiteness writes that whiteness as race operates as an unmarked racial category. Unless told otherwise, the reader positioned as white assumes the characters are white. Unmarked whiteness is of course a type of marking, end quote. And I, I use of whiteness here to make a di distinction between unmarked whiteness because I think that the unmarked whiteness is still centering whiteness. And so when I'm thinking of, of whiteness, um, it's a way of, of actually decentering it, like thinking that there's something off about whiteness. So and I think that uh, some of the, the, the texts I will talk about do some of this here. In this talk, I examine the work of Alejandro Tapi Rivera, a 19th century Puerto Rican foundational writer known for his efforts in expanding the literary and knowledge production of Puerto Rico. In order to contextualize the role of medievalism in Tapi Rivera's work, we must keep in mind that many different movements influenced late 19th century Puerto Rican writers. His writers took up a variety of trends and movements from the Americas, the Caribbean, and Europe, and used them to create a Puerto Rican nationality that would persist apart from Spanish and US colonization. Although Puerto Rico's political struggles are often described through a bifocal lens of colonial identity and a national identity, a lens that gives priority to the nation state, the complicated nature of Puerto Rican nationalism has been rendered static by this particular focus. It is apparent that Puerto Rican nationalism has been, it is apparent that Puerto Ricans have a strong sense of national identity but it is constructed differently depending on gender, race, class, and even place. Many Puerto Ricans do not live in Puerto Rico. That's me, for example. The complicated construction of a Puerto Rican identity must be scrutinized not only from the perspective of colonial and national identities, but also from the intersectional study of gender, class, and race, as well as from transnational or transatlantic perspectives. Although such an endeavor is beyond my capacities and the scope of this talk, I would like to begin to take up how some of these themes evolved in the work of Tapia Rivera by delving into an analysis of gender, race, identity, and medievalism as performed and constructed in both folks to Molen Virginado and La Cuarterona. Overall, it is important to keep in mind that Tapia Rivera aimed to construct an identity through the universal ideas of truth and justice and progressism that included a multiracial Puerto Rican identity. Tapia Rivera's oeuvre highlights the creation of foundational fictions in Latin America, European influences over the island, and ideologies related to mestizaje and mulataje stemming from Puerto Rican and Caribbean cultures. 
Puerto Rican writers use mestizaje as the base for Puerto Ricanness, constructing Puerto Ricans as mestizos who are white enough to belong within the colonial systems they are bound to. They turn Puerto Ricans into marked whites, despite the fact that Puerto Rico is a multiracial island whose population is mostly people of color. And I think this image um, kind of exemplifies the awfulness of criollismo and mestizaje. Um, so the description that, that accompanies this image uh, says, the mixture of African with Spanish blood is not found in all of the people of the island. The higher classes of white people hold themselves as strictly in their own society as any other group. This attractive colored girl is of the higher type of that race, end quote. And I find this so upsetting to read this. Um, so this actually first appeared in a book called Our Islands, Our Islands and Their Peoples, as seen with camera and pencil. And it was part of a two volume tome published in 1899. So a year after the takeover of Puerto Rico, and it really shows how the racism behind colonialism. Um, you know, the image shows an incredibly beautiful and powerful woman, and the description tries to erase that. And, to, um, and I think that's what Criollismo and Mestizaje does. Tapia Rivera's prolific output from plays novels, letters, and poetry to compiling historical documents from Puerto Rico shows that he believed that Puerto Rican national, political, ideological, and cultural progress was the answer against colonial exploitation. He was a feminist and abolitionist and, and ardently argued that the slow process of Puerto Rico towards progress was not due to the colonial perception of different Puerto Rican vices, superstitions, or backward ways due to its multiracial makeup, but was due to the Spanish military, legal, and colonial restrictions. He argued that after these restrictions were removed from the island, progress would really take place. In effect, he offered una visión alternativa donde Puerto Rico tiene el potencial de transformarse en una nación moderna y cosmopolita. En Lotapia Rivera is a well-known Puerto Rican writer the texts analyzed here have been neglected by scholars and only recently some of them have been more closely studied. They're not taught in schools and have not been translated into English, partly because many of his works do not engage questions of Puerto Rican identity in the same manner as other texts of the island. This neglect is related to the fact that Tapio Rivera uses different tropes than those presented in the Puerto Rican canon to speak of similar concerns as other 19th century Puerto Rican writers. Although most 19th century writers, including Manuel Alonso, use the Jivaro identity to discuss the relationship between Spain and Puerto Rico. Um, so this image here is an image uh, it's from Ramon Frades called El Pan Nuestro de Cada Día. And it's, it's, it, for a lot of people, it really exemplifies what the Jivaro was. Um, and, it's an interesting picture, especially for me, because um, the picture, the Frade is from Calle, which is where I grew up. So these are the mountains in which I grew up, but it shows El Jibaro uh, as, as an unmarked white character in many ways, and, 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 is, and is creating a Puerto Rican identity that wants to relate to mestizaje, and you can kind of see that happening here. Tapio Rivera creates different Puerto Rican identities. He argues for a multiracial Puerto Rico in La Cuarterona, and in Postumal and Virginado, he presents Arthur as well as English and American discourses of equality to demand equality for all of humankind, especially for Puerto Ricans. His Puerto Rican identity did not align with the needs of the 19th and 20th century Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican elite. And although Tapio Rivera is well established, a well-established Puerto Rican foundational writer, his philosophy is too close to the present Puerto Rican reality as a colony territory of the United States. And many of his works have been left out of the Puerto Rican canon. Tapio Rivera used medieval things to discuss the injustices of colonialism, sexism, and racism to varying degrees. He used the Arthurian myth as part of his national building strategies in which he uses historicity and strength to construct a multiracial Puerto, multiracial Puerto Ricans 
that included off-white and unmarked criollos, mestizos, and mulatto to lead his, Puerto, his ideal Puerto Rican dream nation. Postumal and Virginiado, for example, offers a Puerto Rican identity by creating strong characters, reclaiming historical facts for his own ideology, and by using English and American ideals instead of Spanish ones. The novel uses the Arthurian myth, specifically the aspects of the myth that promote equality and small cultures resistance to the tyranny of larger ones, to advocate for equality for Puerto Rico and Latin America. He used gender strategies and the Arthurian ideal to show a connection between Virginia and ideals of equality and positivism derived from English discourses. Virginia, the woman on the colony, can only reach independence through a benevolent progressive system of government. King Arthur or Lord Berkeley, this relationship between Virginia and Lord Berkeley uses romantic love and off-whiteness to create a Puerto Rican identity through English, English ideals. These tactics, however, remind Puerto Ricans of the reality of Puerto Rico as a colony territory of the United States. It creates a Puerto Rican identity through a Spanish woman, but also links her to British and US ideals of equality, liberalism, and positivism. Ultimately, however, the use of the Arthurian myth as an angle phenomenon, both from England and the US, becomes an emblem used by both the colonized and the colonizer to give hope and security to the island, creating a broken dream of colonial dependency. In Postumo el Envirginado, a comedy of sorts, and the sequel to Postumo el Transmigrado, Postumo, a middle-class Spanish Spaniard, finds himself as a soul with no body of his own and decides to steal the body of a beautiful young woman. He thus becomes Virginia, a middle-class Spanish woman about to be married to a much older and richer Spanish man. Through his new body, Postumo is able to witness firsthand the injustices that a patriarchal society inflicts on women. Injust injustices that begin with his own abusive takeover of the body of Virginia. It is not difficult to construct a parallel between Virginia, the main character, and Puerto Rico. In colonial discourse, colonies and the colonized are often represented as feminine, not to mention that Virginia is the name of the earliest English colonial project and its first claim in the new world. Furthermore, Virginia's experiences could parallel the experiences of Tapia Rivera. An elite man in Puerto Rico, Tapia Rivera is forced to go to Spain where he becomes a colonized individual. Virginia is not only forced to marry a man she does not know or care about, but her husband believes she's having an affair and tries to kill her because of a newspaper article stating that men should kill any woman suspected of adultery in order to protect their honor, he decides to shoot her. As a consequence, and, and all of this is supposed to be funny. It isn't, but it's supposed to be. As a consequence, she is forced to flee her home and moves to France. While settled in France as a singer, she meets Lord Arthur Berkeley a wealthy Englishman who falls in love with her and wishes to marry her. Although they never consummate their relationship, he assumes the role of an equal and rational partner to Virginia, discussing political issues with his friend and gradually transforming her into an advocate for human rights. I think it's important to mention here that the fact that Virginia and Arthur Berkeley never consummate their relationship, but are thought to be married and intimate by onlookers, uh, links them to Guinevere and Arthur. Lord Berkeley becomes Virginia's right hand by presenting her with the opportunity to travel and to understand other cultures, especially English and United States culture. Um, so he, you know, he's English, Lord Berkeley, and he takes her to the US and, and a lot of the play happens in the United States. This all leads to the text using the women's liberation movement in the United States and the image of Arthur to ask for equality for Puerto Rico, thus establishing a connection between Puerto Rico and English speaking countries before 1898, when the United States took over the island. Arthur, a European character, is used to speak in favor of equality for disenfranchised populations. Thanks to Lord Berkeley, Virginia travels to New York, where they go to a meeting in support of women's rights. This meeting is in English, but translated into French by Lord Berkeley to Virginia. In the book, we're reading the his supposed French translation in Spanish. Y no que seamos egoístas, 
Antes, por el contrario, hemos hecho de nuestra causa la de todos los desvalidos del mundo. Y nadie podrá ser esclavo cuando la mujer sea libre. Nadie podrá nacer esclavo si todas las madres son libres. Nosotras abogamos pacíficamente por la fuerza del derecho, porque la brutal la dejamos a los que de ella blasonan y en ella todo lo fundan. Antes llamábamos a esta sociedad Women's Rights Society. Hoy la apellidamos con título que abarca más ámbito moral, Equal Rights American Society. Es decir, iguales derechos no solo para la mujer, sino en general para toda la raza humana. En quote. This is the moment Postumo Virginia realizes that only equality being bestowed upon all humankind will advance society. She decides to go back to Spain where such a movement as the Equal Rights American Society does not exist. Lord Berkeley helps Virginia in this endeavor by presenting her to her own Spanish society as his wife, turning her into an eccentric English woman and thus explaining her approach to society in general. At the end of the text, when Virginia decides to fight in an armed uprising in Spain for her belief in equality, she's mortally wounded. And I, and I do have to say, I really like that um, even, you know, in the 19th century Spain, the English are eccentric. Mm -hmm. um, Virginia's witness to the creation of the Equal Rights American Society is important because Tapia Rivera uses real events in the U.S. for the basis of this fictional gathering. Tapia Rivera distorts history to fit the ideals of equality he wants to present. He uses the first women's rights convention held in the 1840s and 50s in the United States, specifically the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, where the Declaration of Sentiments was written by Elizabeth Cady Kitty Stanton as the basis for the meeting that Postumo as Virginia witnesses. In the text, the convention gives rise to the Equal Rights American Society. Although a similar association did exist, Equal Rights Society, it only lasted from 1866 to 1869, and it was formed many years after the Seneca Falls Convention. This discrepancy with reality shows his subversion of English ideas for his own agenda. Tapi Rivera deliberately chooses to add or omit historical facts in the text, depending on his own particular view on equality. It is not a coincidence that he added the American to the Equal Rights Society. This slight change critiques the Equal Rights Society by pointing out the movement was not inclusive because it did not include the Americas, Puerto Rico, or people of color. Postumo combines heterosexual love and not whiteness with medievalism and historicity to form its own brand of Puerto Rican identity. At the end of the text, Tapia Rivera uses the character Lord Berkeley to establish a discourse of equality through the persona of Arthur. He manipulates the Arthurian discourse for his own agenda, and he creates a new version of the Arthurian myth. In the construction of Lord Berkeley, Tapia Rivera uses the same discourses that were constructing a European culture to form an, an identity for Puerto Rico. The strategic equation of Lord Berkeley, King Arthur, and equality is most evident in, on Virginia's deathbed. Lord Berkeley promises to continue her work and promote her beliefs. Lord Berkeley, pobre y heroica mujer, adorada Virginia, puro por mi ser y por mi raza, continuar, si tengo la horrible desgracia de perderte, tu apostolado, para que tu sexo, una vez libre, sea el verdadero libertador del género humano. Virginia abrió los ojos que había cerrado al terminar su amante, y exclamó, gracias, gracias, amigo mío. Arturo, oye mi voz. Lord Berkeley acercó el oído a los labios de Virginia. No conviene que me dejes morir en este sitio, que me lleven a casa, aunque sea ya muerta. Al decir estas palabras, un borbotón de sangre asomó a sus labios ya de cera. La hemorragia revelaba la profunda gravedad de su herida. Su estado era mortal. This is the first time Virginia calls Lord Berkeley by his first name. And consequently, it is the moment when the reader becomes aware of the character's first name. Virginia calls him Arturo, linking him to King Arthur. In this scene, Berkeley is not only associated with, with Arthur, but also with whiteness. 
He swears by his being and his rasa that he will continue Virginia's work. The use of rasa at the moment that we also tie him to Arthur shows connections between the Middle Ages and whiteness, but also that Virginia's whiteness is not normative, but marked. The use of the word rasa to define Berkeley in contrast to sexo to define Virginia links Virginia to her sex as a woman, not a man trapped in a woman's body, but also unmarks her as white and throws her race into question. In essence, the unmarking of Virginia also marks Puerto Ricans and puts Puerto Ricans and puts Puerto Ricanness in contrast to whiteness. But because it is also, but because also because it also shows whiteness as a race. Virginia's unmarked whiteness turns to an off whiteness. You know, and, and I think the really important thing for me here is that Arthur's whiteness is not normative in this story. Um, the fact that, that the text says that um, it, we should be known as a gendered society. It's quite interesting what is happening here. After Virginia thanks him for continuing her work for equality, she is taken to her home. It is from her house that the, fu the funeral proceedings depart. En cumplimiento de la súplica de Virginia, fue conducida a su casa y de allí partió el suntuoso entierro. Numerosa fue la concurrencia. Se trataba de la inglesa rica y noble a quien la sociedad conocía. Y era bastante novedad haber muerto batiéndose en una barricada por la eman emancipación de la mujer. Era inglesa y semejante excentridad parecía muy natural, aunque nueva y admirable. El sacrificio había enseriado lo que hasta entonces pareció cómica extravagancia, solo por propia de una hija de alguien. This passage, the narrator explains how Virginia was viewed by the Spanish society. She's described as the daughter of Albion. Albion is one of the oldest names given to Britain and perhaps Scotland. The similarities between Albion and Avalon are striking. Moreover, the construction of Avalon as the resting place of Arthur was well established by 1880. In a way, to the Spanish society that did not understand her ideas, she had, all, she had become a knight and an advocate for equality. Tapia Rivera's use of English and US ideals are tied to the fact that the US was already thinking of taking over the island and began an ideological campaign to make said takeover more palatable to Puerto Ricans. In other words, Puerto Ricans believed that the U.S. as a former colony that reached independence would bring freedom to Puerto Rico. But these facts on the relationship between Puerto Rico and the U.S. are unknown to Tapia Rivera. He uses the ideals of Arthur, positivism, progress, and equality as a final attempt to speak to the elite criollo population of the island about the needs of a multiracial Puerto Rico. In this sense, Postumo must be understood from what came before, mainly the play La Cuarterona which shows that Tapi Rivera understood the importance of the Middle Ages to discuss whiteness as European and how whiteness was tied to the colonial hierarchies that binded Cubans and Puerto Ricans to the Spanish crown in the 19th century. Crispulo, one of the characters of the play who represents Peninsulares, explains the colonial hierarchical system of 19th century Cuban Puerto Rico. Camila Stevens points out that Tapi Rivera satirizes both the practice of buying titles and the obsession with racial purity through the character of Crispulo, who, in a conversation with La Condesa, Carlos' mother, who is not named anything other than La Condesa, assures her that his money can buy him access to upward mobility. He states that he could acquire such, such titles as Conde de Bemba or Marques de la Macagua, but that he would prefer to be Conde de la Edad Media. Camila Stevens' anal analysis of the scene shows but the play is concerned with two forms of passing, Spaniards passing for real royalty and mixed race people passing for white. Nevertheless, another important component of the scene is the use of the term Middle Ages to signify whiteness and Europeanness. Bemba is a central Bantu language spoken in Zambia, the Southern Democratic Republic of Congo and Tanzania. A Macagua is a Taino word and the name of the Macagua tree, a tree indigenous to Cuba. And so you know this, this play is set in Cuba. The scene shows that for Crispulo, upward mobility and a sense of belonging can only happen by rejecting black and indigenous systems and by accepting whiteness and Europeanness. 
Similar to Lord Berkeley becoming white and Arthur at the same time, the use of the Middle Ages shows that the Middle Ages were tied to whiteness. Crispulo's obsession with racial purity and title mirrors the ways that the Spanish crown, peninsulares, the Spanish governments, the Sp Spanish governmental structures of Puerto Rico, as well as many criollos also dealt with race and were obsessed with limpieza de sangre, creating a system that included the following terms as human categories, peninsulares, criollos, mestizos, cuarterones, mulatos, negros, criollos, and negros, among others. Tapia Rivera's La Cuarterona, however, proposes a new system in which he does away with the different case produced in the Spanish system and creates a Puerto Rican identity despite a Puerto Rican identity. Despite his radical proposal, this new Puerto Rican system not only excludes peninsulares, such as Crispolo, it also excludes African Blacks and creates a system based on colorism. Um, the, Stephen Silverstein, he, uh, he's a scholar that works on mainly Cuba, but also Puerto Rico. He really done, he's done a lot of work on how peninsulares were in some ways racialized through antisemitism. And so it, it, what's happening with Crispol is, 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 is very complicated and I'm not gonna get into it, but I do recommend Stephen Silverstein's work. Alice Walker defines colorism as the prejudicial or preferential treatment of same race people based solely on their color, end quote. And Kimberly J. Norwood expands on Walker's definition and writes that colorism is not racism, although there is a clear relationship. A clear example of racism would involve a, a business that refuses to hire black people. Colorism would not preclude the hiring of a black person, but there would be a preference for a black person with a lighter skin tone than a darker skinned person. From this example, one can see too that colorism can not only occur within same race peoples, but also across races. Colorism is, is often gendered because of its unique relationship to who and what is beautiful. It has a tendency, although not exclusively, to affect and infect women more than men." End quote. The Puerto Rican identity highlighted in La Cuarterona comes into view through several of the characters of the play. I have already delved into the character of Crispulo and his position as a peninsular, but characters such as Carlos, Julia, and Jorge also represent specific ideologies within the play, ideologies that we see in Tapia Rivera's later work. Perhaps this might be a good moment to pause and give an overview of the play. Set in Cuba, La Cuarterona tells the tragic love story between Carlos and Julia. And, and clearly here, Julia is also a play on Juliet, which shows another example of his how well they, he knew English work, right? Carlos, a Cuban criollo, recently returned from his medical studies in France, realizes that he's in love with Julia, a young woman that La Condesa, Carlos' mother, took into her home as a baby. Julia is a white passing black woman and was identified by the colonial Cuban and Puerto Rican society as a cuarterona or a quadroon. She is also in love with Carlos, but is afraid to go against societal and La Condesa's expectations that would frown upon their union. In fact, their marriage would have been illegal in Cuba at the time that the play is set. Beyond this racist and classist problem, La Condesa has arranged a marriage between Carlos and Emilia. Crispulo's daughter. Their marriage would be one of mutual benefit for La Condesa and Crispulo because Crispulo would gain a title and La Condesa would gain the monetary means to keep her hacendado afloat. Crispulo and La Condesa plans would be thwarted by Carlos and Julia's marriage. So La Condesa lies to Carlos and Julia and tells them that Julia is the daughter of Carlos' father, a, a mulata woman who was considered a slave by her, by the, her society. Carlos is horrified by the idea of incest and decides to marry Emilia and thus abandons Julia. Julia's pain at these events turn into a fever and in her feverish delirium, she poisons herself with her fever medicine and dies. In a moment of anger and disgust with the criollos of the play who have all failed Julia, Jorge, a black criollo and a loyal servant of Carlos and La Condesa tells the truth and exposes that La Condesa lied to Carlos. 
Julia was the daughter of Crispulo, who sold Julia's mother when she was pregnant because he did not want to deal with the repercussions of raping a woman and getting her pregnant. Jorge decries the lies and immoral actions and states that just states and, and says that justice will be served from above. The play was meant to be seen and heard in the theater and therefore was written for an expansive audience beyond the criollo elite. The characters seem to represent a holistic view of colonial Caribbean characters. Carlos, for example, is a criollo that has returned to Cuba from France and represents the idealized figure of the white colonial intellectual as an horrible romantic hero willing to renounce the social prestige and economic profit that his marriage into Crispulo's family would have brought. Not only that, throughout the play, Carlos makes the argument that criollo colonial subjects like himself become very much like women subject to negotiations of economic and social capital. And yet, his actions and inability to help or understand Julia show criollo complicity in the processes, both symbolic and material of slavery. In some ways, Carlos Stans mirrors Postumac Virginia, who is a man inside a woman's body and who believes that universal equality is the only way forward. And they, they actually also both spend time in France. Um, as Khalil Char Perez explains in a quote that could seemingly be describing Virginia, Carlos' patriotism for a world vision of community and effective bond of fraternity is built on what Tapia described later in Miss Memorias as the cosmopolitan principles of truth and justice. Carlos' rejection of the colonial order represents a romantic, sentimental form of anti-colonialism. It unveils the colonialist fictions and abuses that overdetermine the experiences and identities of colonial subjects, especially subalterns such as Julia, end quote. Ultimately, Carlos' position as a criollo in love with a white passing black woman and his inability to fulfill his own promises to be with her shows that Carlos, as a romantic version of the man of letters, cannot survive in a colonial setting. Just like Virginia, as a romantic gender version of a woman of feminist principles, cannot survive in Spain. Nevertheless, while Carlos has several aspects that link him to Virginia as a colonial subject, he also embodies many of the qualities that we see in Lord Arthur Berkeley. Both the construction of Carlos and Lord Berkeley imply that characters placed in the position of the subalterns, such as Julia and Virginia, can only reach freedom through the colonial white men of letters. These men become tropes that represent sentimentalist heroic figures, paternalistic emancipators, and mirrors of elite criollo ideology that assumes that white creole intellectuals have the moral responsibility to establish, as Carlos says, a fraternal order, as Jared Perez shows. And yet, both Julia and Virginia's trajectories demonstrate that white criollo paternalistic ideologies are not the way forward, but instead hinder truth and justice. In contrast to Carlos, who must accept that his understanding of the world continues to bring pain and suffering to those in disenfranchised positions, Julia is constructed as a tragic victim with no agency of her own. Her character demonstrates the colonial hierarchical values of the colonial government and the Spanish crown exclude blackness. The audience is meant to have an affinity with Julia through her status as a cuarterona and the stereotype of the tragic mulatto. As a white passing black woman who openly accepts and lives with her black identity, she becomes a tool to unsettle the relationships of power between the colonized and the colonizer and questions the whole enterprise of slavery. But at what cost? The cost is that Julia dies tragically after being sick with a fever and denouncing her own black positionality as a stain, a mancha. La mancha a term that begins to be associated with both blackness and womanhood in the Middle Ages. And in Puerto Rico, La Mancha is also associated with being Puerto Rican. La Mancha de Platano, for example, is a common Puerto Rican term that means to be Puerto, that means actually just to be Puerto Rican. In the island, the term alludes to the black stains that plantains leave behind in your hands but also to the fact that Puerto Ricans are jibaros and mixed race. La Mancha then is not necessarily a physical mark, but it is still a racializing marker. In 
and as I keep looking at this image that's supposed to show a he bio, bio yeah, right? It really strikes me that he has the plantains right in front of him. So what does it mean that a he bio, who is supposed to be mestizo has the plantains front and center? And I don't, I don't have an answer. Julia's tragic death and her rejection of her roots forced the Puerto Rican playgoer to mourn that the colonial state allows for such devastation. Julia's trajectory also links her to Virginia as the body that shows the violence and devastation of the colonial order. Virginia's body was forcibly taken from Virginia's soul by Postumo, and Postumo's enlightenment through his understanding of woman's disenfranchisement came at the expense of Virginia's actual agency. Julia's ability to create colonial discomfort through her unmarked whiteness and Virginia's similar bodily meaning signaled through, signaled through her body and soul dichotomy is what leads to their deaths. It is their female embodiment that questions the colonial status quo. Julia is not given agency. Instead, she becomes a tool to draw the reader into an anti-slavery discourse. The positionality or lack of positionality given to Julia is in stark contrast to the given to Jorge. Jorge, a black man whose character, both as a dramatic figure and as a complex mental and ethical stance, goes from a loyal servant, uh, and he was probably a slave, actually, but it's, it's not very, it's not completely clear in the play, to, to a servant or slave of Carlos and La Condesa to the final speaker of the play, who demands justice, justice for Julia's death and who exposes the white elite's lies and corruption. While Carlos' romantic love for Julia cannot help him see Julia's pain, Jorge is able to create a bond with her through their shared blackness. It is this bond that leads Jorge to break his silence and expose that La Condesa lied to her son and that Chris Puro is Julia's father. Jorge breaks with the previous discourse of the play, which placed ideologies of emancipation on the mouth of the white criollo. The, the ending of the play shows that Carlos, like Arthur, is not wholly representative of Tapio Rivera's ideology. Instead, the play gives Jorge the voice to decry colonial injustice and to demand retribution. It creates a moment that uplifts and reaffirms the voice of the black criollo and places Tapio Rivera's most valued ideologies, truth and justice, in the body and voice of a black man. Both Stevens and Char Perez argue that this ending affirms cultural difference by recognizing mulataje as a central component of Caribbean culture and that the play goes against policies of segregation and blanqueamiento of the times. <clears throat> Tapi Rivera ended the play by unsettling both colonial and criollo hierarchies by pointing out that the emancipation and anti-colonial ideologies cannot come solely from the white men of letters but from Puerto Rican people, which includes the population of color of the island. Tapi Rivera, for example, believed that all Puerto Rican children should have access to education. And I don't, I haven't seen this anywhere, but I, my parents were telling me that they, they saw um, a, like um, a documentary that said that Rafael Cordero, who is the, the image here is of Rafael Cordero, and he's an important black teacher in Puerto Rico, that he was actually Tapio Rivera's teacher and that he taught him how to read and write. And I think that's important to sort of think about. Despite Tapio Rivera's ideals, he was still a criollo, living in a white supremacist colonial system, and his ideological Puerto Rican identity excluded African blacks. Therefore, he accepted blackness conditionally. Jorge is described in the notes of the play as a negro creol y serio, nada de comico ni bostal, ni en el decir, ni en el manerismo. A serious black creol, nothing of bostal or comic in his mannerisms or speech. The dichotomy between the terms creol and bostal is paramount. Creol implies born on the island, Spanish speaking, and with an understanding of Caribbean and Spanish cultures. In other words, Creole means black, Blacks born and raised in the Caribbean and whose identity and culture are Caribbean. Bosal, which derives from the word muscle, comes from the fact that Black Africans were taken out of slave ships and sold wearing muscles. Bosales was the term used to describe African Blacks that came to the Caribbean directly from Africa and grew up with their own distinct African traditions 
languages and cultures. For his description as a serious black Creole, Sinada de Bostal, in his speech and mannerisms, shows that African blacks were excluded from Tapio Rivera's Puerto Rican identity. As a final comment on La Cuarterona, I would like to point out that despite Tapio Rivera's being renowned by his contemporaries as El Iniciador de la Literatura en Puerto Rico, his play did not receive the same attention as some of his other work. In fact, his contemporary, his contemporary men of letters did not seem to want to deal with this play at all. Although the play was published in 1867, it was not performed until 1878, five years after the abolition of slavery in Puerto Rico. So he wrote the, the play before the abolition of slavery, was never actually able to uh, show it. It wasn't shown until five years after the abolition of, of slavery and was not staged again until 1955. So that's 77 years later. Charles Perez notes that although the colonial spectacle of La Cuarterona speaks in many ways to the island's socioeconomic conditions and racial relations, the Puerto Rican cultural elite largely disregarded the play from the date of its publication up to the second half of the 20th century, when critics began to approach it as a proto-nationalist performance, end quote. The play's ideologies that introduce a multiracial Puerto Rican identity questions the criollo elite's motivations and argues for a more inclusive movement seems to have been rejected by the criollo elite who simply sidestepped the play altogether. I argue that Postumo continued to ask for a progressive cosmopolitan Puerto Rico through the ideals of truth and justice by questioning the role of whiteness. Nevertheless, Tapi Rivera further stratified his Puerto Rican hierarchy his Puerto Rican hierarchy based on colorism, which continues to affect Puerto Rico. Although Tapia Rivera's mixed race Puerto Rican identity through mulataje rather than mestizaje did not become part of the identity formation, formation paradigm of early 20th century Puerto Rico, the repercussions of colorism can be felt to this day. Kimberly Figueroa Calderon, a Puerto Rican activist who works with the, the Red de Mujeres Afroamericanas, Afro Afro-Caribeñas de la Diaspora, the Colectivo J, has described the process of erasure and colorism that Afro-Puerto Ricans experience through local governmental and economic agencies. Puerto Rican schools, for example, celebrate that Puerto Ricans are mixed race because of contact among, among Tainos, Españoles, and Africanos, while, um, while Puerto Rican schools cover the history of the Tainos and Spaniards, they begin the history of Africa with slavery and only represent Blacks as slaves without prior African history or culture. Figueroa Calderon explains that Puerto Rican schools teach that the only function of Blacks was that they were workers, and schools do not teach that Africans brought to the island had a lineage and a history. Although Puerto Ricans with Black heritage, such as Rafael Cordero, Pedro Albizu Campos, Roberto Clementes, and Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, who was part of the Harlem Renaissance, are lauded as Puerto Ricans, schools condition kids to reject their African heritage and erase Puerto Rican blackness. La Cuarterona and Postumo show that the Puerto Rican people are not well served by the unmarked white men of letters. Julia dies because of her love for Carlos and only Jorge's support of Julia and re rejection of the criollo elite brings to an, an a demand for justice against slavery. Virginia is shot in an uprising in Spain and Postumo's soul is incarcerated in limbo for all eternity. And yet it is the union of these characters together that can bring truth, justice, and progressismo and can begin a Puerto Rican nation. These texts imply that change will come from Puerto Ricans. La Cuarterona was written with the knowledge that abolition would happen in Puerto Rico. And in Postumo, right before Virginia's death, she realized that many women have joined her cause and they will continue fighting for justice. Virginia, who is evocative of a colonial space, follows her beliefs and dies with a bullet through her heart. She shows strength and worthiness. Ultimately, time and time again, Tapi Rivera argues that it is not the criollo elite that will bring about changes in Puerto Rico, but the ideals of truth, justice, and progreso. Tapi Rivera published Postumo in 1880, a moment when the Puerto Rican tropes of identity were being forged but also a moment where the island had not gone through a colonial business exchange. 
It's true that because of the similarities between post move and the takeover of Puerto Rico by the U.S., the text is not part of the Puerto Rican canon. But it's also true that Tapia Rivera was using romantic love to create a Puerto Rican identity, showing that despite the use of English and American themes in his work, he was creating a national identity similar to those of Latin America. It must be emphasized that Tapia Rivera was a man who culturally belonged to the Puerto Rican Criollo elite. His texts do not demand independence for Puerto Rico or equality, perhaps for him to be a first-class citizen in Puerto Rico and the rest of the world. Tapia Rivera's white English Arthur was written to serve Puerto Rico as a, as a Latin American space, even if the impact, like the impact of colonization, is one of dependency and colorism. Throughout Tapia Rivera's complicated and often contradictory narratives, medievalism is used to complicate whiteness, mulataje, and mestizaje. Tapia Rivera seems to be aware of whiteness as a racial category and not as a normative human condition, a feat that many in our own contemporary society have yet to achieve. He uses the Middle Ages to discuss race and construct a multi-ethnic Puerto Rican identity, and his use of Arthur in particular helps him to imagine a relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States as a way to achieve Puerto Rican freedom. And yet his national, his national and identity building strategies were forged through colorism and therefore have continued to exacerbate racism in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, um, for your very, very fascinating talk. Um, um, I would like now to read a few questions um, that have come in, if that's all right. So I actually yes, only see one, but um, yeah, so this question comes from Gina Hurley. Thanks so much for this exciting talk. This question will reveal how excited I am to read your book. It strikes me that in some medieval texts, I'm thinking of the alliterative Morte specifically, but there are certainly others. Arthur is under threat of Roman colonialism at the same time that he pursues his own violent project of conquest. Does this tension appear in any of the texts that you've examined here? No, these, these texts are not, Alejandro Tapia's work in particular is, is not about conquest. Um, it actually, it, it's, it, yeah, there's the, the, the conquest aspect is not there, which is interesting uh, because it, it's trying something different. Um, so, so yeah, it, and in the, it's the, in the text that I've been looking at is the only one that really deals with Arthur. And it's, it's one of the few texts that I, I think, I feel that Arthur is not tied as well to conquest. It's, it's not his fault that like, you know, 10 years later, how the United States took over the island. Al although the United States was already checking the island out, right? So I would say that it's, it's an Arthur that, that is not participating in conquest, but I, I do think that the, te the test does have an ambivalence to this Arthur. Um, so I think there's also a, quite a few things happening there. I, I, um, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, um, the next one's from um, Alex Pena. Can you speak more about the, settle, uh, the setting of La Cuerterona in Cuba and why Tapia Rivera chose this setting instead of Puerto Rico? Um, I think that the consensus is because of censorship. It, it would have made it easier also because I think you could, you could create, have characters like La Condesa. I think it would have been harder to do that mm -hmm. um, in, in Puerto Rico to have characters that had, um, like they were part of the, um, that had titles, right? And then I think finally created some distance. I think those are the big reasons. So while I'm waiting for more questions, um, I have one of my own, if that's all right. Um, so Alejandro Tapia Rivera was um, obviously an abolitionist and women's rights advocate. Um, and he obviously chose his characters' names very deliberately, right? Um, so yeah. naturally, I can't help but fixate a little bit on Virginia and the connotations of her very name. Um, yeah. 
Because he was a women's rights advocate, I don't think that the choice was quite as simple as well. Virginia sounds like La Virgen, and therefore I'll name my character this to make her seem virtuous and likable to the audience, right? Because I think that's a little too reductive. Um, but at the same time, he could have named her Victoria, for instance, um, but he didn't. Um, and he named his real life daughter Catalina, I believe, and not Virginia. So I'm curious about what you think about not only the author's styles and stylistic and plot choices, but about his name choices and the symbolisms that may lie there. I, I think he was very deliberate about his names. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a few things that are happening here. So Virginia is also the first colonial space in the United States. So it ties it to that. He has another play called Cofresi, which there's a character that I think has a lot of similarities with Virginia. His name is Ricardo, which is evocative of Puerto Rico. They both die by being shot in the heart. Um, so I think he, he chose that deliberately. I think he was also tying it to, to the idea of virginity. And I, I'm, I often wonder if that is also tied to the, the gendered implications of the text. So people have read the text as sort of queer and trans because you have a man trapped in a woman's body and this now man realizes what it means to have, uh, what it means to live as a woman, right? So, so people also bring up that it, it's, it's interestingly creating sort of a, a relationship between like Puerto Ricans and queerness and in, in creating collaboration or sort of reciprocity in that way. Uh, but it's also, he Postumo forces her out of her own body. So it's also, he is taking over that body. Um, and so the play is, is really playing with all these things. Um, and it really, it, it, it really defies expectations. I, I really think everybody should read it because it's just, it, it does so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we have another question, if that's all right. Um, this is from Consuelo Concepcion. Um, the Arthur trope has been used to project a national ideal almost since the Middle Ages and began to be especially used during the early years of what was to become the British Empire, which was expressed most prominently in um, Impnum Spencer's The Fairy Queen. Do you see any similarities between the Renaissance Arthur and the Boricua Arturo? Well, I think that he's actually using 19th, 19th century, I, the ways that 19th century European writers, especially English writers, were talking about Arthur. So between, I think, 18, the 1860s and the 1880s, there were a lot of Arthurian sort of text and characters being written. And, and it's really, I think, tied to that. Um, so, so I think he's, he's absolutely... Um, using English ideas and trajectories to, to do this Arthur. Um, how much did he knew about the Renaissance? I don't know exactly, but I would, I, my inkling is to think that he must have known of the fairy queen. He definitely knew enough about Shakespeare to name La, La Julia Julia. So he, he was definitely uh, someone that would have gotten, would have tried to read everything that he had gotten his hands on. Um, Gina has a, a follow-up question, and um, she says, thanks so much. That's really interesting, um, and I'd love to hear more about the ambivalence in that portrayal of Arthur. Well, I think that is ambivalent because he doesn't, he doesn't save her. He doesn't do, he, he like takes her back and then lets her be in this uprising where she dies. Where was he in all of this? I just, I think that there's something weird about that, right? Um, and then in the ending, when he promises that he's going to like, he's going to continue her fight for her, but we never see that happening. Well, the scene that to me is most interesting is that he actually, uh, Post Postumas Virginia realizes that he's not the only woman fighting in this uprising because other women are also dressing up as men and fighting for women's uh, equality because of him, because of Postum or Virginia. And so in a way to me, those, those are the women are the ones that are gonna take up the cause. It isn't actually Arthur. And so that's why I think that is an ambivalent character. It, 
it, it, it, it talks the talk, but doesn't walk the walk. The woman walk the walk. Right. Um, I think maybe I'll ask one last question, um, if that's okay. Um, so earlier in your talk, you talked about um, women who were shot or were encouraged to be killed because they were erroneously thought to be adulterers. Um, and that this was supposed to be funny in the in the literary sense. And I can't help but draw parallels to medieval texts, like ballads in particular, where something that's absolutely atrocious and gender-based violence is supposed to be like a humorous moment in the text. Um, what do you think about these moments? And could you maybe speculate on how you think that anyone at any time could possibly have found that funny? In here is... It, it's funny in several ways. It's supposed to be funny that this is happening. It's also, it's supposed to be ridiculous that he wants to shoot her, right? But it, the, the whole book is supposed to be funny. Like the, the scene where Postumo is taking over Virginia's body is supposed to be the most hilarious thing. You're watching her body like twitch and move and, and it's described in these really over the top ways. And I mean, it, there, literally you have the soul of a man stealing, kicking out the soul of Virginia out of her body and stealing her body. That's not funny, but the, the book completely makes it funny. And the book is completely using the, the idea of him, of having a man in a woman's body as part of that. And, and, and so it, I think it's very violent in that way. And the fact that it's supposed to be funny, um, it's interesting. And, and of course the character changes and realizes its mistake. And actually at the end, he post to a lot of his choices are trying to do what he thinks Virginia would do. So he's trying to be respectful right? because he realizes that he stole her body and his so he's, like he kind of tries to start to be respectful, but all of it is, is, is comes from an act of violence. So it doesn't matter. And so he's, he's actually then uh, trapped in limbo and put away and nobody's allowed to ever talk to him or ever and he's you know so it's a it's a very the ending is not funny but but it is absolutely trying to use uh comedy to sort of mitigate all of the things that the the play is doing the, the novel is doing i see so like absurdist humor almost yeah yeah, yeah. but do you think though in that initial scene i understand that the character changes um that the humor is supposed to be for a male audience? Oh, I think this whole book is supposed to be, I mean, okay. I, mean I think he, he could have imagined a female audience, but I think all his work is mainly, for the most part, for a international uh, audience, a male audience and a criollo elite audience. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I, that's what I would assume is his main audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just can't help but, um, I mean, you know, we, we wouldn't consider that funny today, hopefully. Um, and it's just hard to imagine even women at the time being like, oh, yes, that's hilarious. Um, yeah, so thank you again so much for this, for this talk. Um, that concludes our program for today. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Please keep a lookout for our future events. We have several exciting speakers lined up for the rest of our spring 2021 series. Good night. <laughs>